the last two homilies I gave, I dedicated to the notion of naming and the importance of it. And this is the third Sunday, so I would go and do a recap of those two homilies and then open it up to question and answer discussions. And so I wanted to pick a, a reading that spoke to the idea of naming. Um, and I'm sure the Catholics among us remember that probably the most boring reading you'll ever hear in church is at Christmas time when we read from the first chapter of Matthew's gospel, the genealogy of Jesus. It goes from Abraham all the way down to Jesus. And it's really, really boring. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot his Judah and his brothers, and da, 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 da. Really, really boring. Well, if you think that was bad, you ain't heard nothing Yes, Listen to this reading. Top names over the last 100 years. The following table lists the 100 most popular given names for male and female babies born during the last 100 years, 1920 to 2019. For each rank and sex, the table lists the name and the number of occurrence of that name. These time-tested popular names were taken from 175,744,628 male births and 171,010,925 female births. Please note that popular names listed below are not necessarily consistently popular in every year. For example, the name James, ranked as the most popular male name over the last 100 years, has been ranked as low as number 19. Similarly, the most popular female name in the table, Mary, ranked as low as 127. The good news is I'm only going to re read out the 10 top ones, not the 100 top ones. Here we go. Rank number one, James, 4,735,694. Rank number two, John, 4,502,387. Rank number three, Robert, 4,499,901. Number four, Michael, 4,330,025. Number five, William, 3,601,719. Number six, David, 3,563,170. Number seven, Richard, 2,467,544. Number eight, Joseph, 2 million 352,889. Number nine, Thomas, 2,160,330. And number 10, Charles, 2,106,078. And for the girls among us, number one, Mary, 3,265,105. Number two, Patricia, 1,560,897. Number three, Jennifer, 1,467,644. Number four, Linda, 1,448,309. Number five, Elizabeth, 1,428,981. Number six, Barbara, 1,402,428. Number seven, Susan, 1,000,000. 104,407. Number eight, Jessica, 1,045,519. Sarah, 993,847. And finally, Karen, 985,728. These are words inspired by the Social Security Index. So being as how it's the third Sunday of the month, uh, I normally do a recap of the previous two homilies and then open it up to Q&A. And for the last two weeks, I've been focused on the idea of naming, the importance of naming. So I'm going to give a recap of the two previous homilies. And I'll, the recap will basically be just four quick points. I'm going to talk about naming God. Secondly, naming creation. Thirdly, naming incarnation. And then fourthly, naming humans. So naming God. Quick recap. As I said to you uh, uh, last week, Judaism was not monotheistic for a long, long, long period of time. 
It did not become monotheistic until about the year 550 BCE, when the last two tribes of Israel were in exile in Babylon, and they came under the influence of the great Zoroastrian religion, which had reduced the pantheon of uh, divinities down to two gods, uh, Ahura Mazda, the god of light, and Ahriman, the god of darkness. And then Judaism kind of shrank that down to one god. But for most of their history, they're not monotheistic. And certainly Moses was not a monotheist. And when he gave us the Ten Commandments, the very first commandment says, first, I am the Lord your God. You're not allowed to have stranger gods in front of me. He didn't say you're not allowed to believe in false gods. He acknowledged there are lots of gods out there, but I'm your guy. I chose you and you chose me. So you're not allowed to put other strange gods in front of me. When you read through the Hebrew scriptures, and the problem is that we're reading it in translation. And so it's like different languages are really good at different things. English is a brilliant language for uh, engineering and for science. We have about 300,000 words in the English language and another 600,000 technical terms in the English language. But it's not a great language actually for poetry or for music. To do that, you need to go to maybe the Romance languages, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian. It's not a great language for storytelling. You know, you need to go to the Celtic languages to find a great uh, storytelling. And so when you're reading English translations of other works, you're at a disadvantage. So for instance, if you're reading you know, Greek theology and you come across in English the word love, there's just one little bucket that we throw all these kinds of forms into. In the original Greek, there are six totally different words uh, for, for love. There is philautia, which means love of the self. There is pragma, which means long-term love, something that lasts forever. There's agape, which means a spiritual kind of love. There's philia, which is brotherly love or deep friendship. There's eros, which is sexual love. And then there's ludus, which is playful love. So there's six totally different words in Greek, but they're all lumped into the same word, the same bucket when you translate it into English, love. So it's totally inadequate. And the same thing is true when we're reading the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures. When we cross, come across the word God in the scriptures in translation into English, we're assuming that it's a translation of a single you know, Hebrew word. And that's not true at all. There's at least seven different Hebrew words that are translated into English as God. And so, for instance, you have the word El, which appears about 200 times in the Hebrew scriptures. And El was a Canaanite God. He was the creator God and the chief divinity of the Canaanites. And that's used for God very, very 200 different times in the Hebrew scriptures. Then there are variants of that. There's El Yon and El Shaddai, which means uh, the God of hosts. And then one which appears 2,500 times, Elohim. And Elohim is actually a plural. It's gods. But uh, when you hear it in the scriptures, sometimes it's referring to the Elohim of Egypt, the gods of Egypt. And sometimes it's referring to Yahweh, who is called the Elohim of Israel. Sometimes the word Elohim in the scriptures means the seraphim. Sometimes it means spirits of the dead. And Elohim is actually the first name of God in the Hebrew scriptures. In the first book, in the first chapter, in the first verse, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, we were told, in the beginning, Elohim created. So the very first name given to God in the Hebrew scriptures is Elohim. Last Sunday, I read for you a passage from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, where God appears to Moses in the burning bush. But it starts off by saying, Elohim called to Moses out of the burning bush. And then he changed his name to Yahweh. When Moses wanted to know, who are you? He said, Ehiye, Ashir Ehiye, which literally means, I will be who I will be. And that's represented by Yahweh. And Yahweh appears 7,000 times in the Hebrew scriptures. But when you know, pious Jews are reading the scriptures in the original Hebrew, whenever they come across any name for God, they won't pronounce it. Instead, they say Adonai. And Adonai just literally means the Lord. So they won't even pronounce uh, the names of God. And when they're outside of the synagogue and speaking ordinarily, they won't even use Adonai. They, they say Hashem. And Hashem just literally means the name. It's like your man. So they won't even say what the name is. And I told you last Sunday how these two names, particularly Elohim and Yahweh, got intermingled in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. The first name Yahweh was created by the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin, beginning about the, the year 950 BCE. And the name Elohim came from the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes that seceded 
on the death of Solomon in 933 BCE, and they used a different name. But when the Northern Kingdom fell to Assyria in the year 722 BCE, a few scholars fled to the south, bringing Elohim and the Northern scriptures with them, and they meshed the two scriptural traditions. And so some places you get God called Yahweh and some places called Elohim. So that was the kind of the origin of the names of God in the Hebrew scriptures. I went on then and I talked about naming creation. And I have this theory that when God asked Adam and Eve to name the, the animals in the garden, he wasn't asking them just to put identity tags on the guy with the long neck or the guy with the big proboscis. He wasn't asking them to hang name tags on these. He was inviting them to have a relationship with the essence, the soul of each of these creatures, to have responsibility and have stewardship for it. So to name somebody in the scriptures is to have a sense of the essence of the other. And it becomes very important and that you're not just hanging an identity tag. And you get the very same notion happening in uh, the Aboriginal cultures of Australia, where they believe that all of creation was actually sung into being by the ancestors. Everything that existed, mountains, rivers, whatever they are, oak trees, they were actually sung into being by the songs of the ancestors. And I find the very same thing in science when you look at science from a kind of a, a metaphysical perspective. When we talk about the stuff out of which all uh, creatures emerge, we call it matter or material. It's basically frozen light. Scientifically, all matter is frozen light, particularly frozen sunlight. And so when you look at that word matter or material, what is it from? The Latin is matter, which means mother, in English, it's mother. In Gaelic, it's mohir. And so again and again and again, we realize that the essential stuff of creation is mother to us. And so naming creation, we're, we're identifying mother in a sense. And then uh, mother needs, needs sound. So where frozen light is responsible for all of matter, all of this stuff, that which gives stuff its individual form you know, uh, a mountain as distinct from an oak tree, as distinct from a human being, as distinct from a bunny rabbit, what gives it its particular shape? Because when you think even of mammals, all mammals basically are constructed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So how come one mammal takes uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and creates a daffodil out of it, and another one creates uh, an elephant out of it, and another one creates a human being out of it? Because there's an inner guidance system that organizes the matter, and that we call that Logos. And so in the very, very beginning of John's Gospel, we hear, in the beginning was Logos, the word, the sound, and the Logos was with God. All things were made through him, and without him was made nothing that was made. So it's sound and vibration that gives form to matter. So you start with mother, and then you give form uh, to the stuff. So naming something then is really, really important because you're setting actually, you're setting up a frequency, a vibration, you're sending out information. And I believe in fact that that's how DNA constitutes individual organisms, that it's logos, it's sound, it's vibration, that's organizing the carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen into particular forms that, call, that are you are an oak tree. So that's what I said then about uh, naming creation. I went on to talk about naming incarnation. And in a meditation a long, long time ago, um, what I saw was that the last two things that Grandmother God whispers in the soul's ear as it's parachuting into incarnation. She whispers your secret, sacred name. And that's not going to be the name you're given at baptism, I guarantee you that, or how you're going to be known by your friends or family. This is a secret, sacred name, which is your essential vibration your essential information system. And the second thing she whispers to you is your mission. Remember why you volunteered to go down there because you're here now, because you volunteered to be here now. You didn't get lost you know, somewhere in the Milky Way galaxy and wind up on planet Earth instead of someplace else. You volunteered to be here now. And Grandmother Guide reminded you of what your secret sacred name is so you could vibrate with that essence and not get lost. And you could remember why you came. And I give the impression that in the languages that I've learned at least that there are some very special sounds and combinations of sounds. And particularly I find when the, uh, the constant N and M are in the same word, it has this very, very definite kind of frequency. 
It connects soul, you know, with the uh, naming. And so, for instance, in Latin, the word for a name is nomen, and the word for a soul is anima. So you've got an N and an M contained there. In Gaelic, the word we use for uh, a name is anim, A-I-N-M, and the word we use for a soul is anum, A-N-A-M. So it's the same N and M's repeating again and again. You get this sound coming through the word amen, and numen as a numinosity, the mystical, or om in, in Sanskrit. Now, Sanskrit, just as I mentioned it, is a very interesting uh, language. When you think about it, when human beings first learned to verbalize as distinct from just vocalizing, when they developed language skills, oral language, how did they decide to name the objects in their environment? Did they just kind of uh, hang identity, give a guess, let's call it that, and hang an identity tag in it? Or is it deeper? Sanskrit scholars claim that in the Sanskrit words are not identity tags, they're actual creators. That when you pronounce words in Sanskrit, you're calling into being that which does not yet exist, except in potentia, exactly like the, uh, the, the Aborigines. That is the music that calls everything into being. And Sanskrit claims that the sounds of Sanskrit, when you learn Sanskrit and you learn the phonemes and the syllables and the sounds of Sanskrit, what you're actually doing is you're learning how to call you know, forms into being how to bring creation alive. And I told you that a few weeks ago, I had this really powerful meditation in which uh, I'm sitting in my meditation room and I got this little Tibetan bowl that I strike and it rings. And I suddenly realized that the womb is a singing bowl, that the womb is this extraordinary container that sings a particular kind of music that takes in the potential of a human being and creates a human being out of it. And there are many musicians attendant upon this phenomenon. So there's grandmother God who starts that process as the soul is incarnating. There are angels and mentors who are accompanying the soul in into incarnation. And then there's mother and father and family who are helping to create from this little, tiny little zygote a human being. And my impression was that, that these same musicians, grandmother God, angels and mentors, mother, father, family, are present at conception, at birth, and at death. When we're dying, we're attended by the same list of musicians. And it, particularly today, I'm speaking to Madeline, whom I've just met, and Carlo O'Neill, who I know very, very well. Uh, if you're a mother who's lost a child, I guarantee you, that you were present at their passing just as you were present at their coming. Whether you were physically in the same room or not, doesn't matter. Your spirit and your guidance were present when your child transitioned, coming in and going back out. As I'm sure my mother Peg was when my sister Ethna died you know, of a brain aneurysm uh, on the 25th, on the 26th of January, 25 years ago. And so as mothers, you're present at their coming and their going, and I would particularly want Carol and Madeline to celebrate that fact today, that in the case of Todd and Aaron, that you were present in the transition of your children. You gave them life as they came in here through incarnation, and you gave them life as they transitioned back into the arms of God. And so the music of the culture then becomes really, really important. What kind of music are we creating for the babies whom we're birthing into our world? Is it cacophony or is it symphony? because the music either forms or deforms the evolution of the incarnated child and the, and the species itself. So we have to be really mystical and really mindful how we name, how we call, and how we refer to people and to places and events. Names actually are a kind of, um, they're calling into being a specific kind of reality. So we have to be really mindful of our language. I said that in my opinion, um, Naming is the acoustic equivalent of the observer effect in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we know that it is the observer that collapses the probability wave down to the specific outcome. Names actually cause a reality to come to be. And we do this as individuals, we do it as cultures, we do it as a global community. The names we give, the words we speak, and the thoughts we have are creating the future that we're selecting out from all the possible futures that lie ahead of us. So your words become flesh. That was my third point. 
And then I talked about naming humans. And I started two weeks ago with the story of how my grandfather, who was sent out to record the birth of my mother, who had been born at home, got waylaid by his buddies and dragged into a pub. And by the time he got to the courthouse to register my mother's name, he forgot what her name was. So he gave his best shot at it. And he put down a name, which wasn't actually the, mother, the name my grandmother wanted. And my mother didn't discover that until she was getting married nearly 20 years later. So I talked then about naming rituals. And I mentioned just three different kinds. I mentioned the Irish system of how we name kids in Ireland. The first boy is called for the paternal grandfather. The second boy by the maternal grandfather. The third boy by the father. The first girl by the paternal grandmother. The second girl by the maternal grandmother. And the third girl by the mother. And then any other kids you have, you're free to name them any way you want. And I talked about the Jewish system of naming, that you can never call a child after a living relative. It has to be a dead relative. And I talked about the Kalenjin cultures and the three different kinds of names, ways that we give kids names in the Kalenjin culture. The name of the circumstances attended upon their birth, um, a name of the ancestors who is reincarnated, and then a pet name or a parge name, Gainathab Musarek. And I talked about baptism then, the importance of baptism, that it's not just a cutesy ceremony so that you can you know, have fun with your friends, but it's a commitment to raising a child in a spiritual ethos, inducting a child into a spiritual community, being supported by spiritual godparents, rather than just picking somebody's out of the hat. I like this person. You're going to be the god godmother or the godfather, whether or not you have any commitment to spirituality or to my child's spirituality. I talked about so often that we accept uh, babies as a gift. Um, it's like you accept a very, very precious gift, all wrapped up with paper and twine. And you unwrap the paper and the twine, and you throw the gift away, and you treasure the paper and the twine. So we take this extraordinary gift from God, which is a, a soul incarnated. And then we just attend to the wrapping. We feed it, and we clothe it, and we send it to school, and we ignore the essence, which is its spirit, and its, uh, and its soul. So I talked then about um, how changing a name can mean a change of identity and a change of mission. So when uh, uh, girls decide to become a nun, they go into the convent, they shave off their, their hair, they change their clothes completely, and they change their name. So it signifies that it's a change of identity and a change of mission. And I gave the example from one of my favorite examples from a, a tribe of people in West Africa who, when a mother is about eight months pregnant, they sequester her, hypnotize her, and then they ask the child two questions. And they believe that the, the baby will use the mother's voice to answer the questions. And the questions are, what is your name? Secondly, what are you coming to do? What is your mission? And I ended by saying that I really believe given the, the, the chaos of the times in which we live, for which we volunteered particularly, that there are some very brave, compassionate souls entering incarnation for the first time. And I, for one, am deeply grateful to those little children, those latest prophets of God, the latest form of God's revelation. So let's open it up to Q&A, guys. I was wondering if there's a way to connect with... Uh, the name that's whispered into our ear as we're coming in, if there's a way to figure out what that is. Okay, that's a great question. And uh, um, the first thing I would say is if you discover what it is, keep it private. This is nobody else's business. You have to hold this sacredly to yourself. Uh, you can't uh, uh, kind of, uh, in some senses, you know, reduce its effect by just sharing it and saying, here's my sacred name. What you're gonna find is, it's not gonna be a name like Johanna or John or Sean or Michael or whatever. It's not gonna be like that. It's gonna be a, a vibration, a musical sound that when you hear it, you, but you recognize it and it'll cause your soul to resonate at a really, really, really deep level. And so um, it may be a piece of music you hear that suddenly alerts you. It could be a sound of nature that alerts you. It could be, you know, in a, a moment of meditation that alerts you. But when you hear it, it's a frequency, it's a vibration, and it's not gonna sound like you know, the typical name and the list that I wrote out. But you'll recognize it simply because you're gonna start crying when you hear it. When you recognize it for the first time, you're gonna have tears. Your soul is gonna vibrate because you're home. You know maybe for the first time in your life who you really, really are. You've identified with the body and you're not a body. 
You've identified with emotions and you're not your emotions. You've identified with your mind and you're not your mind. You've identified with your personality and you're not even your personality. You've identified with a job or a relationship or a gender or ethnicity and you're none of those things. And when you hear this song for the first time, you'll realize at the core of your soul, this is who I really am. And then your mission will change. You'll know it. Nobody will have to tell you. Good morning, Sean. This is Peter. I have a recall of uh, when I came to Earth. Uh, I was above the Earth, and I, th th these two masters on either side of me said, it's time to go back. And I said, I don't want to. And they said, but you agreed to. And I said, but I don't remember that. And they started to push me toward the Earth. And uh, they said, they didn't whisper a secret name. They said, forget who you are. Okay. And I said, I don't want to forget. Okay. And the closer we came to the planet Earth, the less I could remember. I felt my divine consciousness going away. The next thing I remember, I was this little wet baby lying in a crib, you know, <laughs> and wondering, what am I doing here? I don't remember who I am at all, you know, so my life has been trying to remember <laughs> who I am, you know. Well, Peter, uh, having read your books and spoken with you on a few occasions, I know bloody well that you know who you are. <laughs> Thank you. You know it in spades. So I think part of the kind of the... Um, part of the volunteering for incarnation is that we have to forget who we are and then wake up in the course of incarnation. It would be an unfair advantage if we came in totally remembering and never forgetting. It would be like somebody from the moon, you know, signing up for the Olympics for the high jump. And since the gravity is six times less than the moon, you know, jumping over 36 feet and getting a gold medal. And so we have to start off where everybody else is. There has to be a level playing field. And from that place of equality, we have to do the work which allows us to remember who we actually are. And I certainly know you, you've done it in spades, Peter. Yeah, well, thanks. I'm trying to get back there fully, but I'm still here on the planet anyway. Because you're you needed, are. because you're needed. Yeah, God bless. Yeah. Namaste, my brother. Namaste. When I was listening to the second, um, homily, I, I, I thought about the third commandment, you know, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Yeah, right. And I just wondered, like, how uh, does that relate to our relationship with God? Does it relate to our relationship with others? Is it why the he in the Hebrew scriptures, they didn't speak mm -hmm. God's name? I was just wondering if you could. Yeah, sure. That. So there are two things that come to mind when I hear this. Firstly, you know, is swearing the idea that you call God to witness to your particular little truth when it's just a, an individual perspective. But the more important thing is that, you know, theologies of all kinds, you know, um, destroy our understanding and our connection with the divine. You know, theology in some senses is a, a human dogmatic decreeing about who God is in herself, what she had for breakfast, who she likes and who she doesn't like. The whole idea of a chosen people or the whole idea in, for instance, Roman Catholicism, extra ecclesiam nulla es salus, outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. This notion that there are special people and that this God of the entire cosmos is peering down you know, through billions and billions and billions of, of galaxies. And he picks out one galaxy, the Milky Way, and he says, oh, I've got a special relationship with the Milky Way galaxy. And then he looks at the billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and he picks out our sun and says, ah, oh, and I really, really, really love that solar system. And of the nine planets circling around the sun, he says, and there's one planet that I really, really love, and that's planet Earth. And as the planet is spinning, he says, and there's one tribe of people or one religion that I really, really, really love, and it's X or Y. I mean, that's a ludicrous notion. This is the little child who wants to believe that his mommy is the prettiest woman on the earth, and his daddy is the strongest man that ever lived. And so not taking God's name in vain is pretending that theology captures God. Nothing captures God. The nearest we can get to God is the, uh, the mystical realization of the ineffability of the mystery with which we wrestle. We can experience God, but we can never articulate who God is. And so taking God's name in vain is attempting to put into theological language that which is ineffable. And this is what Meister Eckhart said when he, when he said famously, you know, I pray daily to God to rid me of God. In other words, don't be trapped by theologies. Buddhism said the very same thing. They say, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. 
So whatever kind of mission guys we make up, whatever stories we concoct and say, this is who God is, and this is what God prefers, that's you know, taking God's name in vain. So it's an injunction to um, become mystics, not just theologians or not kind of sheep following the, the dictates of you know, uh, religious institutions. Hey, Father Sean, I got a challenge for your thing about the moon and that one, you know, that analogy, right? About yeah, coming right. from the moon with the high jump. They cheat and use steroids all the time in the Olympics. <laughs> Why the hell can't we remember shit when we incarnate? That's not fair. Why the hell can we come with cliff notes and, and, and little secret reminders and like a code that unlocks stuff like with software patches i yeah. don't agree i yeah. want a cheating i want something <laughs> come on where's the, the truth, pat come on the truth is Ravendine, that we come we do come with the cheat sheets but it's inside in the soul we have to start looking inwards we're not going to be looking outside to institutions for it but we'll sometimes come across maybe you know a, a, a piece of writing you know or a story from which we infer you and I have had a dialogue this week about Ralph and Sam, a brilliant yeah. dialogue. <laughs> so, hidden within the mythologies of the world <clears throat> are deep, deep, deep truths, hidden within the parables of Jesus. But if you try to interpret the parables of Jesus literally, you get into big, big trouble. Even when you do it symbolically, you get in trouble. You have to uh, interpret them mystically. So all the folklores of the world contain the cheat sheets. But we listen to them, we think, oh, that's just, uh, that's just mythology. That's a weird belief system that a primitive tribe came up with. These are not primitive tribes making up stuff. These are articulating deep, deep truths in story form. I've said to you many times that, you know, storytelling is the archived wisdom of a culture. So if you really, really want to understand a culture and understand you know, how God is working through a culture, look at their proverbs and look at their uh, mythology. And if you know how to unpack those properly, you have all the cheat sheets you need. This has been bothering me for a long time. You sure. talked about the when the the young girls become nuns, they right. have to shave their hair and right. change their clothes. And right. Why do not priests do do that? Well, in actual what? fact, they did. The old, the monks used to do it. It was called tonsure, and so um, there was a they would create a huge big ball spot in the top yeah, of their heads. I remember that. Yeah. And they certainly they changed their names and they changed their outfits as well. So you see, uh -huh. for instance, a Franciscan walking around today. You know, they're not street clothes. So in actual fact, they did. You know, and there were injunctions about, for instance, within Judaism, that you couldn't cut your hair. You had to have these long pairs at the side, or you couldn't uh, cut off your beard. Mm -hmm. So there were injunctions about personal uh, um, appearance that were very, very important to anybody who was taking their spiritual tradition uh, very, very seriously. So in actual fact, every place you find a monastic system or nuns or people who are uh, deep into kind of the... Uh, um, the belief system, the cultural belief system, you got the kind of um, the Amish, you know, who have a particular style of dress that goes way back to the 1600s. And so that for them is indicative of their kind of um, commitment to their religious belief system. And so in all traditions, particularly people who are really, really serious, you find that there are injunctions about appearance, you know, beard, hair, uh, apparel, names. So again and again, and you're going to find this. It's not just with Catholic nuns. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. Uh, could you say that when you are looking for your real meaning and purpose in life, the deep one, you are looking for your name? Yes, that's brilliant. If you know your name, you know your mission, Herman. And if you know your mission, you know your name. So there are four great questions. And in fact, any, uh, the answer to any one of them, if you really get the answer, you have the answer to all four. The four great questions is, who is God? Secondly, who am I? Secondly, thirdly, who is my neighbor? And thirdly, what is my mission? And if you get the right answer to any one of these questions, you have the right answer to the other three. If you really know who you, what your mission is, you know who God is, you know who your neighbor is, and you know what your, uh, uh, what your purpose is. And so name and mission are totally connected. If you really, really get any one of them, you get the other one as well. Now, just let me say one word about mission. Uh, we sometimes think that mission is about our profession that you came here to be a farmer or an artist or a psychologist, that's not mission. Mission is always about the acquisition or the further development of a particular virtue. So mission is always about, I'm coming to be more courageous or coming to be more patient or coming to be more forgiving or coming to be more compassionate. And so the mission is always about virtues. 
And then we're invited to choose professions that will be in the service of the virtue. But we're not coming here to be, uh, uh, to be bus conductors or, or, or you know, artists or, or, or priests. We didn't come here to be that. Uh, and let me just say one more word about that. I say to you at the beginning of every uh, mass that you are priests. What do I mean by that? Everybody who volunteers for incarnation on planet Earth is a priest. You have come here to infuse planet Earth with the divine energy. So your incarnation is your ordination. Now, sometimes we'll, you know, we'll create subspecialized and we want particular people to be surgeons or particular people who have a guilt, have a, an expertise to be car mechanics or whatever, or some other people who are interested in scripture, tradition, or theology to be formally priests. But everybody who, who, who volunteers for incarnation, you're a priest. Incarnation is your ordination. And so that is your mission. And it means then focusing on particular virtues in the course of any particular uh, life. I just had a question about baptism when you were talking about it. Um, I raised both of my daughters, you know, they were both baptized by you. And when I was married, my husband agreed to, uh, you know, raise the children as Catholics. And um, even though he wasn't Catholic, my daughters, they don't believe anymore. Okay. So what, how do I, I mean, I did everything I could, but I, I, I even taught Sunday school and, um, and then their godparents, they were involved for a while, but once I got divorced, they sort of went away. Okay. So it's a great question. So we have to distinguish between religion and spirituality. Religion yes. is merely the training wheels for spirituality. I've used this example before. You know, when you're a two-year-old learning to cycle, cycle you need training wheels. If you're still using training wheels when you're 18, we got problems. So all religions really are training wheels for spirituality. And so religions need to set their adherents free at some stage to create their yes. own cosmologies and you know celebrate their own liturgies in various ways. Now, religion is important because it allows us to form communities and communities are important. It allows us to kind of articulate an ethical system and that's important. It may afford us, you know, uh, liturgies that give us music and, you know, you know, togetherness, that's important. But this yes. journey is very different from religion. So I don't know, you know, where your two daughters, you know, uh, are, are in their lives, but it's very, very possible that their spirituality, you know, it has continued to evolve, whereas the religious practice has continued to shrink. And only they can know that. So I have been watching a series on the Human Genome Project. Um, and so you've talked about DNA today. And so my question for you is, um, in your opinion do you think because we know so little about dna we're still learning um do you think that dna number one is a recording medium for for humanity and and furthermore when we speak about names do you think that each individual person's dna has their name encoded within the dna so we got two very different things going on here. We've got the physicality of incarnation and we got the spirit that comes in. And so we make sure that we don't confuse the two. So a study of the physiology will give us particular kinds of answers, but they can't give us the answers about the mystical uh, essence of that which is coming in. Now they'll dance together and they'll kind of um, influence each other. But uh, a study of the material objects, you know, if you want to understand you know, what a human person is, and you break the human person down to anatomy, physiology, an endocrine system, a cardiovascular system, an immune system, you know, all these systems, and, and then you think that you've understood a human being, you haven't. A human being is a vital, living, uh, you know, soul incarnate. And so no matter how much you understand about the spacesuit, it gives you very little information about the soul inhabiting the spacesuit, although they continue uh, to interact. And so we have, to, uh, we have to bless science insofar as it can help us understand the spacesuit. But most scientists are materialistic scientists, you know, who don't believe in the existence of even consciousness. Most believe that consciousness is um, a, an epiphenomenon of brain activity, of biochemical processes between neurons in the physical brain. And that when the brain uh, dies, you know, consciousness ceases. I think exactly the opposite is the case. Consciousness is that which creates matter and then creates form. And it's using devices like DNA in order to articulate particular kinds of morphologies. So, but we can mix up the two. 
So no matter how far science is going to get with you know explaining the the space to us, they cannot touch. You know, they can't tell us what spirit is about. That is something that's between you and your soul, between you and your sacred name. And uh, so um, DNA research is not going to tell us, you know, what your secret name is. From what I know, Jesus pretty much knew his mission when he incarnated. Um, <clears throat> but I, I attended a, on Zoom a funer funeral service on Friday. It was conducted by a Christian minister, and it was the most boring service I ever heard. And it was promulgating the ideas that I've heard <clears throat> my life, all my life growing up as a Presbyterian, um, which is a quote from the Bible, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through me. I don't, I don't know. I don't believe that nobody comes to the Father but through Jesus. I mean, there's other roots, even though he was an amazing avatar of our age. I think it's somebody else's idea of his mission. It was partly his mission, but not all of it. What do you think of that? I agree 100% with you, Carl. And I'll give you an example. In 1995, I was invited by the Presbyterian Church in Palo Alto to give a series of Lenten lectures, seven lectures during Lent you know, on Jesus. And I entitled the series, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? I remember when I was preparing for that, um, I had a really powerful um, vision of Jesus where he came into my room where I was meditating and I asked him precisely that question. I said to him, are you the way, the truth, and the life? And he says, yes, I am. Because the way is love and the truth is love and life is love. And then spontaneously mm -hmm. he said, and the Buddha is the only way to God because the Buddha is the way, the truth, and the life. Because the way is compassion and the life is compassion. And so what he's saying is that you have to understand what the way is and not kind of mix up the way with a particular avatar. You know, I happen to believe that among the avatars that uh, the Jesus Christ figure, I believe was the most uh, developed, you know, ascended master that I've ever come across. He's a yes. son of God, like you're a daughter of God. There is, not, there is nothing which is not a word of God made flesh. We think that, you know, the, the God only enfleshed once where, you know, the second person of the Blessed Trinity took on a physical form and was born as Jesus of Nazareth. Carl O'Neill is a word of God made flesh. Hannah Burke is a word of God made flesh. Sharon and, and Bill are words of God made flesh. There is nothing which is not a word of God made flesh. The only mm -hmm. question is how self-aware are individual creatures of their inner divinity and ipso facto of the divinity of all the other creatures. So that's the difference between the Jesus figures and the rest of us. Christ was totally conversant with his own divinity and he operated mm -hmm. completely out of that. And that's what he said to the rest of us. The same things I do, you will do, and even greater. That was one of the last things he said at the Last Supper. You'll find it in John's Gospel. It, literally 12 hours before he was died, before he was dead. The same things I do, you will do, and even greater, because I'm going to send uh, the Holy Spirit. And so we have to realize again and again that the, the differences between the avatars, between the great sinners and the great saints, is the level of inner knowing that mm -hmm. you are God stuff incarnate and that you resonate with that, but more importantly, that you recognize that inner divinity in everything else. Otherwise, you're just a narcissist with a huge ego. And so yeah, Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. You can't get to the Father unless you go through love. The Buddha is the way, the truth, and life. You can't get to the Father unless you go through the Buddha, because compassion mm -hmm. is the way. So we have to understand what these great masters are saying, and not just take these words literally, and then lock ourselves into these pathetic little theologies. I'm here with my dear friend, Shelly. Shelly is a sacred sound alchemist and she's staying with me wow. for about a week. And wow. she brought 11 of these crystal singing bowls. Beautiful. And in your homily, you were talking about yes. how the womb is a singing bowl and yes. we can either create music in our lives from a place of symphony or a discord. Right. And I just wanted to share about our experience last night. Brilliant. We were both feeling fairly discorded after being in a very public space and there was, we were anxious from this energy that was around. Mm -hmm. And no matter what I did yesterday, 
I was in meditation. I was in a guided healing light. I could not, I could not find the, uh, the stillness or the clarity. And we were sitting by the fire last night and we, she pulled out these bowls and we started toning them and singing together. And this, every single bit of discord and anxiety left not only my body, mind, and spirit, but our entire home was resonant in this like pure crystalline essence. And there was no doubt, there was no reservation, there was no insecurity or anxiety. It was just my divine essence was just free to express as it needed. And I wanted to talk about the power of sound healing. It, it blew me away um, last night. And I, um, yeah, and I just appreciate you referring to the womb as a, a singing bowl to create, you know, it's, a, it's this like DNA weaving of light and sound to create matter into form and to remember that we are this matter vibrating at different frequencies and sometimes we feel the discord in our bodies like different organs can be vibrating at different frequencies and we'll just feel discorded but this tool was so profound in bringing all of me into this alignment and um i i went to sleep playing them last night and i woke up this morning playing them this morning and i just wanted to share that with you and um and also give a big hello to Shelly and, and the work that she does because it's it's amazing. Thanks a million, Hannah and Shelly. You're very welcome and thank you for the work that you do in the world. And that image that as you hold this bowl here and I can see your light reflecting off it and when you sound it. So this is for me, the two great drivers of evolution are light and sound. And you've got both of them in this singing bowl right now. We know for instance that I totally agree with you. Every cell of the body has its own frequency. Every organ in the body has its own frequency. And so it's like the body is like uh, an orchestra with different kinds of instruments in different places. And the, the job of the conductor is to bring them together into harmony. And that's the job of meditation and spirituality is to take the disparate elements of a physical body and to unite them in a symphony of sound to take the different members of a family and unite them into an orchestra, to take the different you know, nations and cultures of the world, unite those into an orchestra and take the different you know, the species with whom we inhabit the planet and organize those into, a, into an orchestra. That's precisely what we're here to do, to create an orchestra of a, a symphonic orchestra of God's name. I, exactly. And I felt it between us last night when we were singing, our voices were just weaving in and out of each other in this completely natural flow. And how important it is to, we cannot bring the symphonic resonance if we're not ourselves in the symphonic resonance. That's it's right. a, it's a right. reverberation. It's a contagious thing. Right. And um, it's, Yeah, we have to be, you're absolutely right. Try taking a red brick out of a wall and strike you and see what kind of sound you get. Nothing. <laughs> so the container has to be adequate to the purpose. Yeah. Yeah. You say uh, words ma made flesh, right? I was, long time, I was trying to translate it for myself. Okay. So I was thinking about what does it mean in English and then, you know, I couldn't, you know, quite get it translated to myself. Um, and then this morning, so like Mongolian expression came, came to my mind, um, uh, similar that you said, words made flesh. And it's uh, It's basically saying, you know, what you say, what words you use, um, you know, defines the, the mission that you're trying to reach. Or, That's beautiful, love it. That's beautiful. So I wanted to share that. Beautiful. I hope you're teaching your baby that. Are you speaking to her in Mongolian? Yeah, I okay. sing Mongolian songs. But you know, it's interesting as well that um, in all the cultures of the world, mothers spontaneously, you know, sing lullabies, even if they're not, even if there are no lyrics attached to it. They put together strings of sounds that soothe the baby. And this is instinctive to the mother that she knows exactly the kinds of sounds that allow the baby to quieten down. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
I have a question about um, God's words to Moses, right. the Ahia Asher, Ahia. Ahia. Um, I, I'm wondering uh, what you think about that as kind of an affirmation of the divine feminine as Ashira was the mother goddess to oh, the Canaanites. Interesting. Well, um, in Hebrew, Ashir just means who is or who am or who mm. will be. And so it's, um, it's uh, in some senses, it's a grammatical form. Okay. Uh, but of course, there was um, uh, Judaism originally was not monotheistic. And not only that, there was a kind of a, uh, um, a female consort of Yahweh that appears in earlier uh, Jewish mythology uh, that mm -hmm. got kind of, uh, kind of pushed out in patriarchal times. And so many, many, many of the older uh, religious traditions, for them it was obvious there had to be a divine male and a divine female. Otherwise, how could you have creation? And so, you know, if, if you can infer a mystical uh, understanding from any part of scripture that allows you to transcend dogma and religion and unite you with the essence of the Godhead, you know, go for it. Mm -hmm. so, when meanings are made up anyway, in a sense. So if you, can infer, if you can infer a meaning that brings you into alignment with love or compassion, you know, that's the way to go. John, I would like to ask a question that is on everybody's minds. How should we interpret your most exciting reading on choices that our parents made in the United States in naming people? <laughs> how, how should we interpret that? Uh, it's interesting to me that, you know, I think traditionally we tended to get our names in this country because it was a Christian country and most people are Bible reading. And so a lot of these names are names that are coming straight out of the scriptures. I think over the course of the hundred years, it changed significantly. And then with the advent of, for instance, movies, particularly the talkies, and then with uh, television, whatever, more and more now, uh, parents are tending to name their kids after film stars or stuff like that. So the total shift in the culture away to naming you know, our children for, you know, uh, here today, gone tomorrow kind of idols who are not very, uh, very, very often not deeply spiritual people. So it'd be very interesting to me to look at the phenomenon of the kind of the wave of naming that moves through a culture in the course of its history and to find out what is, it, because it's reflecting where the culture is. Is it reflective of a deep spiritual search or is it, you know, reflective of the flamboyant, you know, glitzy, you know, superficiality of Hollywood? That might be a fascinating uh, study. There's a PhD dissertation in that for somebody out there. And uh, a question for everyone here, rather than you, Sean, because you're a mathematician. Why were the female numbers smaller than the male numbers is the question. So it's something yeah. to contemplate okay. on the uh, excitement scale. A <laughs> uh, couple more questions back to Peter and Annika. Yeah, Sean, I'm interested how the word God won out as a name over all the other names for God. Was this uh, cooked up by a couple of Gaelic poets that are published? <laughs> My, you know, the um, interesting that the first great uh, translation of the Hebrew scriptures and of the New Testament, in fact, was done by a guy called Saint Jerome who flourished about the year 400, around the same time as Augustine. So at this stage, they're trying to lick, you know, the whole myst mystical and religious tradition into conformity with orthodox theology. And so anything that creates disparity, you know, or confusion, they're going to lock out of the system. So at the great council of, um, um, was it uh, Nicaea in 325 AD, well, the emperor who had just recently, you know, uh, become a Christian himself, Constantine, he called this first council of the church with the injunction that they were not to leave the council until they created some kind of a creed that everybody could get behind. He didn't want any kind of variance whatsoever. And so I imagine, and this is just as I'm answering you now, that as Jerome is interpreting the scriptures, he's going to try to, um, in some senses, simplify it as much as possible, take as much, you know, ambiguity out of the system and just have us all going down one one track one railroad line and which is there's one god and uh, let's not confuse ourselves by uh, giving this god different kinds of names because that takes us in too many directions and when you think of the early church actually the early church consisted of 
hundreds of home churches, very often led, well led by women, like Mary of Magdala. And these had very, very disparate theologies. And the job of the, uh, the fourth century councils was to kind of uh, get rid of Gnosticism, the notion of you know, um, the sacred knowledge that comes to us as individuals as we engage in the mystical journey, as distinct from what we're told is to the truth by dogmatic theology. And so they're trying to lick, you know, get rid of all these other versions of Christianity and have one creedal formulation, one liturgy, and one canon of scripture in which all of the other books are kicked out. So I'm just imagining as I answer to you that it may have been in Jerome's mind, either consciously or unconsciously, let's not confuse people by showing that there was a multiplicity of understandings of the divine, you know, in the sacred scriptures that we take to be the word of God. Thank you. I, I understand the English word God came from a weather God uh, similar to Odin called Gudrun. Okay. And it got shortened to God. Is that true? I don't know. It might well be. I mean, um, Jerome's original translation was from Hebrew into Latin and from Greek into Latin. So he would have used the word Deus. So right. um, obviously when it got started getting translated into uh, English, so for the longest period of time, there was only one translation of the scriptures allowed by the Catholic Church. And that was the tr translation of Jerome done about the year 400. With the advent of the printing press in the 1400s, and the first book that was, that was published was the Bible. And um, but they started translating into the vernacular and that happened in Germany. So it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, uh, the word God sounds kind of Germanic, whether that was a guide coming from the Germanic tradition that then became the placeholder, you know, for all references to the, the divine in the scriptures. I had a similar experience with the singing bowls. I listened to those about four or five days ago and it was like a complete uh, feeling throughout myself because I've heard singing bowls many times but so I was wondering if if there are certain times when certain sounds can be more healing like if it's their time or if, it, if it's just that we recognize their healing ability um, but I agree with Hannah right now those singing bowls are, are completely uh, I was politically distressed let's put it that way and I, I pl happened to play one of those and it was a complete release of all stress. Okay, so there are two things going on here, Johan. The first one is that uh, scientifically, we know that apparently solid matter is composed of molecules. Molecules are composed of atoms. Atoms have subatomic particles. And for the main part, atoms are 99.9999% empty space. Uh, but when you reduce the subatomic particles, what you get basically is energy. And so this is Einstein's famous formula, E is equal to MC squared. Energy equals mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. So ultimately, all matter reduces to energy. And therefore, everything in the world around us is in energy form, which means it's susceptible particular kinds of, to particular kinds of vibrations and frequencies. So depending on where the matter is located, I'm anxious, I'm happy, or whatever I am, I'm, uh, I have a particular uh, vibration or frequency. And so a particular sound is going to meet that in order to kind of regularize it. And so that's how, for instance, you know, in Ireland, we talk about a musician has to be able to produce three different kinds of music. The first one is um, suantri, which means um, lullabies, the ability to kind of calm the savage soul. The next one is called galtri, which is the ability to create nostalgia in people. And the third one is gartri, the ability to make people laugh. And so you can't call yourself a musician in Ireland unless you can produce these three kinds of music. Now, I imagine the same thing is true for any sounds and any singing bowls. You know, mothers instinctively know when to sing a child a lullaby. If you're at a football game, it's a totally different kind of music. You want music to kind of fire you up and get angry about stuff. And so different music will create different emotional states and different kinds of music will respond to and calm different kinds of emotional states. So you have to find a frequency that's, that's adequate uh, to dealing with the particular uh, physical state and emotional state of the recipient. Sean, you have said that uh, God is love. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more, but I'm not sometimes sure what I'm agreeing with. Because you said there were nine different words in Greek. For love, and I, I was thinking of asking you which one of the nine is the love that is God. But then I sort of realized um, 
that the way I understand love in this conceptual world is by looking at it in terms of its opposite, fear. And when I put love and fear together, then I understand love, I think, I hope, and I understand fear. But it's only by putting two opposites together in this world that we most live in, I, I call it a conceptual reality, um, that I can really get close, to, at least for me, to a, to a deep understanding of an of a extremely important term, i.e. God is love. Great, great question, Tom. And there's two or three things come up for me when I hear you. The first one is when you take those seven Greek words of various kinds of love, and you say God is love. The truth is God is all those kinds of love. So we have to distinguish between the inner divinity, which you know energizes every single human being, and we're going to experience these kinds of love, whether it's agape, which is spiritual love, or eros, which is erotic love, which has its place, or whether it's you know philia, which is brotherly love. So uh, God is love in all these fashions, you know, as she walks around in an incarnated fashion. So we have to realize that God is love in all those kinds of things. The second piece you make is the distinction between uh, love and fear. I am totally convinced as a psychologist that every little baby is born with just two emotions, the ability to feel fear and the ability to feel love. And when fear is self-directed, it becomes depression. When fear is self-directed, it becomes anger. When love is self-directed, it becomes self-esteem. And when love is other directed it becomes compassion. And then these four pieces combine and permute, creating all of the other vices and virtues. But at core, there's love and fear. And what is the fear? The deepest, deepest fear is the fear of not being loved. Mm -hmm. In fact, the fear of not being lovable. It's not just that my mother doesn't love me, but that I'm basically unlovable. Nobody could love me whatsoever. And that's the deepest fear. And it's a fear born of incarnation because we have been temporarily separated from the source, the source of all love. And we find ourselves in these little confined containers where we can't feed ourselves, we can't clothe ourselves, we can't cuddle ourselves. And so we fear not just that we're abandoned, but that we're basically unlovable. So that's the core of incarnation, is to wrestle between that fear, fear and the love. And that's the entire life tra trajectory. It's coming to a place where we realize that every one of us is lovable in essence because we are holographics, the fractals of source. And then we can get over the fear and all its articulations, whether it's anger or anxiety or depression or judgment or unforgiveness whatsoever. Wherever fear raises its head, we counter it with the realization that we're bite-sized pieces of God who volunteered for human incarnation, that we're not only, that we're not only loved, but we're lovable in our essence.